The summer preseason pick said they'd be Super Bowl bound, but the harsh realities of the National Football League show that in early December, the Atlanta Falcons, nearly everyone's early line favorite, are struggling just to make a playoff spot. Hopes of a division title are gone. Now it's time to buckle down and try to get enough wins to qualify for a wild card spot. Falcon head coach Lehman Bennett has led his team to two consecutive victories after a costly slump. But today's opponent is hungry for a win as well. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are in the wild sweepstakes, better known as the NFC Central Race, where four clubs still contend. And Tampa knows that to win today, they'll have to stop Atlanta's 1,000-yard rusher, William Andrews, number 31. They'll also have to contain the conference's most prolific touchdown maker, quarterback Steve Bartkowski. But the Bucks have a pretty fair passer of their own. He may not have Bartkowski's impressive numbers, but Tampa Bay's Doug Williams has proven his effectiveness in 1981. Williams' completion percentage is not the highest in the league, but he makes his throws count when he does connect. How well Williams performs in the stretch should tell how far Coach John McKay's club can go. Another area to watch for, the Buccaneer defense. It's one of the best units in the league, and a major reason for that is the fine performance of rookie linebacker Hugh Green, number 53. Green has been everything the scouts said he would be, and more. It will be up to Green and his mates to stop the explosive Falcons today. Each club has a 7-6 and six record, and both consider this game a must-win affair. From tropical Tampa, it's two clubs struggling for a piece of the NFL postseason pie. The Atlanta Falcons versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on the NFL Game of the Week. Remember a few years back when the Bucks were losing all the time? That first year, Tampa Bay won only one game, a preseason victory against the Falcons. Both the Bucks and Atlanta are far better teams now than they were back then. But Tampa Bay started out the game as if they wanted to be reinstated as standard material for Johnny Carson's monologue. After appearing to stop the Falcons, the Bucks' special teams made a serious mistake. The officials ruled that Tampa had touched the ball and the alert Falcons were quick to take notice. The Bucks argued their case but lost. When this approach failed them, their defense returned and tried their own methods of persuasion. They were much more effective in stopping Atlanta this way. drive ended and the Falcons called on kicker Mick Luckhurst for a 38-yard field goal attempt. Mick's aim was true and Atlanta broke out on top three to nothing. Now it was time for Atlanta's defense to do its part. One reason for the Falcons' disappointing record this season has been a generous defensive 11, particularly against the pass. But few teams in the NFL hit harder or more often as the Buccaneers discovered when squaring off against linebacker Buddy Curry and company. Bucks did start to move when they entrusted ball carrying duties to number 43, Jerry Eckwood. In the early going, the third year tailback out of Arkansas was piling up steady and solid yardage. Eckwood's success enabled the Bucks to use him as a decoy, such as on this reverse that got the ball inside the Atlanta 10-yard line. No. 
Number 83, Theo Bell's run set the stage for the first touchdown of the game, a short inside blast provided by none other than Jerry Eckwood, who followed the lead blocking of his fullback, James Wilder, number 32. The Bucs led 7-3 as the first period came to a close, but no lead is ever safe against the Atlanta Falcons. In a game earlier this year, Atlanta scored 31 points in nine minutes to erase a huge deficit. There have been some areas the Falcons can point to as shortcomings, but offensive might isn't one of them. Behind a superb line, Atlanta can still mix run and pass with the best. And one athlete who can perform both skills with style is running back William Andrews. Andrews sustained a strong Atlanta march until penalties and Hugh Green pulled the plug. Stalled once again, Atlanta turned to kicker Luckhurst. From 44 yards out this time, Mick did the trick, narrowing the Buccaneer lead to 7-6. Atlanta wasn't exploding for big point totals, but neither was Tampa Bay. When the Falcons held on Tampa's next offensive series, it looked like a golden opportunity for the Georgians to take the lead. But the Buccaneer defense came up with another big play. Number 34, Cedric Brown, had his sixth interception of the year. A second look shows that Bartkowski simply overthrew his intended receiver. And there, waiting in the weeds, was Brown. Of Brown's previous five interceptions, two were a turn for touchdowns. The others led directly to scores. Tampa Bay's offense kept Brown's personal string intact as Doug Williams went immediately to tight end Jimmy Giles, number 88. The 38-yard scoring play was the sixth of the season for Giles. Somehow the 250-pounder was allowed to run free down the middle of the Falcon zone. This lack of coverage cost Atlanta six points. Only two minutes remained in the half, and the Bucks were now ahead 14 to 6. Tampa Bay felt it was imperative that its defense keep Atlanta out of the end zone in the time that remained. Holding this kind of offense without a first half touchdown would be a tremendous confidence builder for this talented but young defensive squad. They did achieve part of their goal. There would be no touchdown. But Atlanta did get points, thanks in part to the all-encompassing talents of a Mr. William Andrews. Just five seconds to go, Luckhurst hit his third field goal and the Falcons cut the lead to 14 to nine. The game was going through to form. Atlanta could move, but couldn't dominate Tampa's defense. The Bucks offense saw weaknesses in Atlanta's pass coverage and exploited them. Still, the Falcon faithful felt good, trailing by only five points on the road. Surely in the second half, their heroes would fare better. 
What the second half brought was a seesaw, hard-in-your-throat battle that would not be decided until the very last tick of the game clock. As evening began to embrace Tampa Stadium, a feeling of uneasiness embraced as well the 90 men suited up for this contest. Playoff spots were at stake, and as each player took the field, he knew that this encounter in the season's 14th week was a critical one indeed. On the first play after the second half kickoff, Lynn Kane powered ahead for an important 34-yard gain, and this time the Falcons were not about to settle for a field goal, as they had three times previously in the first half. A face mask penalty after an Alfred Jenkins catch gave Atlanta a first and goal from the Buccaneer three, and after a five-yard loss, William Andrews blasted in from eight yards out. Andrews' touchdown gave the Falcons a two-point lead. The score was made possible because the Bucks were caught in the blitz, and number 54, Richard Wood, was simply shoved out of Andrews' path by number 70, guard Dave Scott. Coach Lehman Bennett must have offered some stirring words at halftime, for in the first 30 minutes, Atlanta was unable to penetrate Tampa's end zone. Yet on their first possession of the second half, the Falcons cruised easily downfield to take a 16 to 14 lead. Unfortunately for Atlanta, Buck coach John McKay must have offered a few terse one-liners himself, because when the Falcon defense dug in to maintain their two-point lead, they found the feisty Floridians, especially Doug Williams and tight end Jimmy Giles, eager to move the football as well. Giles probed the soft falcon underbelly for 18, and then rookie James Wilder found the short middle zone poorly patrolled once more for a pickup of 26. The knock on Doug Williams over the last few years has been his apparent inability to throw the football accurately on short to medium pass routes. No one ever questioned his arm strength, rather his passing touch was the area in doubt. His clutch pass to Wilder in between coverage reveals just how much Williams has improved this season. The drive stalled at the Falcon 23, but when Atlanta said the Bucks stop here, you know what they answered in Florida, when the drive goes kaput, call Capice. The hot-footed Bill Capice, that is, who nailed his sixth straight from 42 yards out. Coming in, Capice had hit on five straight, and this successful boot left him one shy of Garo Yapremian's team record of seven straight. Capice's accuracy gave the Buccaneers a 17 to 16 lead, and linebacker Buddy Curry wished he'd cool off right quick. But Atlanta can boast of a player, too, though, that has been red hot all year long. Bard went to his favorite little receiver, Alfred Jenkins, for a 21-yard gain as the third quarter wound to a close. Catches like this reveal why the pencil-thin Jenkins is a true all-pro. Coming in, Jenkins already had caught 13 touchdown passes and totaled over 1,100 yards in receptions. But only acrobatics like this show why he is certain to be named Atlanta's most valuable player in 1981. Perhaps if you were to create the perfect football player, he would have the heart of Alfred Jenkins and the strength of William Andrews. Someone once said, when you watch Andrew's power, it's as if God took out a chisel and said, I'm going to carve me a fullback out of solid granite, put a number 31 on him, and name him William Andrews. Andrew's second touchdown of the half returned the lead to Atlanta 23-17. 
While he gave the ball to number 66, Warren Bryant, to perform the spiking honors, that honor should have gone once again to Dave Scott, number 70, who blocked as well on Andrew's second score as he did on his first. Nearly 14 minutes remained in the game, a game that would not be decided until seconds remained. Doug Williams is not a believer in ball control. To be sure, he is not a disciple of the old doctrine that dictates that a good quarterback takes what the defense gives you. Williams loves to throw the bomb, but after three full quarters, he was being rudely treated by Atlanta's pass rushers. Finally, with about 10 minutes left in the game, Williams swung for the fences, and in one mighty moment, he cleared the bases. Number 89, Kevin House, is one of the fastest receivers in the entire NFL. He averages nearly 20 yards a catch, and the old fly pattern is his first love. This one went coast to coast, 71 yards, and another look shows that pure speed and a perfect throw were simply too much for rookie Bobby Butler, number 23, to contend with. House is certain to go over the 1,000-yard mark in receiving yardage this season, but this catch by far has been his most important of the season. Judging by the end zone party, you'd think his teammates thought it was a pretty dandy catch, too. Trailing by one, the Falcon defense enlisted the referee to play inside linebacker in the hopes of halting any more damage by Tampa Bay. It's doubtful that the striped gentleman will actually replace Fulton Kuykendall or Buddy Curry on the Falcon roster, but his impact on the game was far more dramatic three plays later. Number 36 safety Bob Glazebrook raced downfield with an errant Doug Williams toss, but instead of the Falcons having a first down at the buck 10 yard line, the officials huddled and ruled that Atlanta had committed a personal foul, giving the Bucks a first down at midfield. Indeed, their decision was a game shaper. Quickly, James Wilder took advantage of the good fortune. Wilder, a rookie, outraced his own blockers and was driven out of bounds at the Falcon 10. Less than five minutes remained in the game. The Falcons trailed by one. But when the Bucks had an apparent touchdown when Williams hit Giles, the officials this time made a ruling favorable to Atlanta's cause. Giles did indeed make the catch, but he was whistled for offensive pass interference when he pushed Glazebrook in order to make the catch. Bill Capice was called in to extend his streak to seven. Older Larry Swider tried to do a little refereeing on his own, but one of the strangest drives downfield came to a close without any change transpiring on the scoreboard. Capisa's streak came to an end when his 32-yarder with two minutes remaining sailed wide to the left. The Falcons still trailed by a solitary point, and if they were to maintain a stronghold on wildcard aspirations, Alfred Jenkins would have to combine with Bartkowski for a big play, as Atlanta prepared to put its two-minute offense to a stiff test. The reward, a possible playoff spot. The foe, the Buck defense, one of the hardest hitting units in the game. Over the last two seasons, Steve Bartkowski has fired more touchdown passes than anyone. But this season, the Bucks have only surrendered eight scores through the air, the NFL's lowest, and they weren't about to give up the long one now. 
Bard knew it, so he looked for Jenkins on a medium-range pattern. Again, Jenkins made his second circus catch of the game, and with seconds left, Mick Luckhurst was called in with perhaps the Falcons' season hanging in the balance. From 45 yards out, Luckhurst's luck ran out as Falcon Hope sailed wide to the right. Tampa Stadium erupted with utter bliss, and the type of spirit that consumed the city back in 1979 when the Bucks won their first and only division crown. The clutch one-point victory, when considered in the wake of losses by Detroit and Minnesota, meant that for the first time this season, the Bucks stood alone atop the NFC Central. The Falcons, meanwhile, dropped their seventh game of what must be a disappointing season. The Bucks' eight and six mark gives them a one-game lead in their divisional race, and they have their own destiny firmly in their embrace. San Diego and Detroit are the foes that await them. For Atlanta, their 7-7 seven seven record is truly unexpected, for they were the men who many had hailed as Super Bowl champions in waiting. Coach Lehman Bennett called their problem a fear of failure, saying his team had not played this season with the confidence they possessed last year. In Atlanta, this year will not easily be forgotten.